I'll start by saying something kind of deliberately, purely in engineering terms that's maybe a little bit provocative to give you a sense of what this idea, often called solar geoengineering, is. And then I'll step back a little bit and say a little bit about uh, some real basics about climate change. Some of you may know all this, but hopefully it's helpful. Uh, and then try and come to some uh, uh, more concluding statements about how to think about these technologies for deliberately manipulating the planet. So let me first say the sort of core idea in really blunt terms. Suppose we wanted to stop the climate warming in 2020, or perhaps to cut the rate of warming in half. It turns out you can't do that with confidence by cutting emissions, because the warming is due to the cumulative uh, consequence of human emissions over industrial history. So if you want to stop, it's not so easy. We have to stop emitting. In the long run, if you want a stable climate, you must bring emissions to zero. Nothing I'm going to tell you about these alternative technologies gets you out of the need to bring emissions to zero. But there are a range of other things you could do. So suppose you wanted to actually deliberately stop the warming of the planet. One thing you could do is you could make the planet more reflective. In some kind of crude way, climate change is due to uh, the energetic balance of the Earth. As we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we're making it harder for the, uh, the, the energy that comes in in sunlight to get out. And so if we make a little less energy come in in sunlight by making the Earth a little bit more reflective, then we will compensate for some of the climate change that comes from the accumulating greenhouse gases. How could that be done? What you would need to do if you wanted to do this is to, to, to find a deliberate way that is also controllable and not so expensive to alter the entire planet's reflectivity. And you might say this seems extraordinarily hard, but in fact, there are ways to do it with current technology, ways that have real disadvantages, but it seems pretty clear that it's doable and doable at relatively low cost. Um, the basic idea, the idea that we know most about, is to put reflective aerosols, tiny droplets or solids, into the stratosphere, where they reflect a little bit of sunlight back to space, the way a fine dust is, the way pollution reflects uh, sunlight back to space. If you put a droplet of water in the stratosphere, it would reflect some sunlight back to space, just like a droplet in a cloud does. But water in the stratosphere evaporates too quickly, so that doesn't work. But if you put a droplet of, say, sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, which is what naturally happens with volcanoes, you will reflect away some sunlight. So let's say that we wanted to cut the rate of warming in half starting in 2020. In the first year, you'd have to put about 20,000 tons of sulfur into the stratosphere, and you have to do that by putting it about 20 kilometers into the tropical stratosphere. That's about twice as high as a commercial aircraft flies. But in fact, there are lots of aircraft that fly at that altitude. Uh, and there's no big difficulty of developing common subsonic aircraft that fly at that altitude. It's been done since the 1950s. And in the first year, as I said, you need about 20,000 tons of material. And to give you a sense of perspective, Currently, humans put about 50 million tons of sulfur into the atmosphere as pollution, pollution which is killing about 3.6 million people globally. So we're talking about uh, 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 powerful forces here with real impacts and real risks in both directions. So if you put that sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, each year you'd have to put a little bit more in because we're still putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if you want to balance the rising amount of carbon dioxide, against some kind of opposing force of making the Earth more reflective, each year you'd have to put more sulfur into the stratosphere. After 50 years, you'd be putting about a million tons a year of sulfur into the stratosphere, and you would have cut the rate of warming in half. And the cost to do that is sort of frighteningly small. It sounds like it's a few billion a year. And to be clear, we've actually like paid for aircraft engineering studies, and this has been looked at now for 30 years. So there's some confidence when, when we give you numbers like that. I think, what can we say about this? We can say with confidence that it actually would reduce the rate of warming. 
we can say with significantly less confidence, but some confidence, that would reduce warming and also other climate changes we care about, like extreme storms, on a regional basis. And so the balance of evidence from the whole standard suite of climate models that are used for the standard assessments of, say, the IPCC, is that if you do this in a way such as I suggested, doing it not to reverse all climate change, but doing it to cut the rate of warming roughly in half, that you would make the climate impacts that actually harm people less in most places. That's the kind of core idea. This is and should be a kind of shocking and scary idea. We're talking about deliberately engineering the Earth's climate. And this idea, it turns out, is not new. Uh, the first report, for example, on climate change that laid out the modern problem of climate change to the most powerful decision maker in the world at that time went to President Johnson when I was two years old in 1965. And that report had roughly the right climate science that we know now. And one of the few things it suggested doing was doing this. So these ideas aren't new. Our understanding of climate change isn't new. And our understanding of the range of things we do about it isn't very new. But on this topic, there's been a kind of scientific taboo. So people have been concerned about research or even discussing this idea openly. Mostly, I believe, for fear of what's often called the moral hazard for fear that by offering the what appears to be a quick fix, a kind of technological get out of jail free card, as we say in America, that, that um, we will weaken the political power of efforts to cut emissions. I think that's been the underlying reason why there hasn't been much research. In the last decade, there's been significantly more work on this topic. Uh, so now there are you know, hundreds of scientific papers and some real effort, but still no systematic research program. In our children will make decisions about climate, just as we are. Mostly our decisions meant to do nothing. Our children will make decisions, say in 20 years, whatever you think of as a generation. We can't uninvent this idea. This idea is 50 years old. You can't, you could kill me, but you can't uninvent this basic idea. There's nothing we can do now, even if you think it's morally reprehensible to talk about engineering the climate. There's no way to prevent people in 20 years thinking hard about it. If we have no research program, what we give our children is ignorance. It means they'll be making decisions with no good information. And they may be making decisions in time of a crisis. Maybe they've found out that the West Antarctic ice sheet is really going to collapse. My view is that we need to have a serious research program so the next generation has better information to make decisions. So that's a really quick overview to this crazy topic. I'm happy to take questions on, on any aspect of it, and I'd love to be challenged. So if you think that this is just nuts to even be talking about it, put your hand up and say so. Thank you.